Hey, everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. We have a very, very special show for you today. As you know, this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My very special guest today is here as a result of a podcast that he recently did with Rich Roll that has now over a half a million views that has caused his phone at the True North Health Center to ring off the hook with people wanting to find out more about what he discussed on the podcast, specifically water-only fasting. Therefore, we decided to do this special Q&A and asked you to please submit your questions in advance, especially if there was something on the podcast that you want a clarification on or maybe didn't understand. And we received over 50 pages of questions. And some of these have 15 questions on a page. So I don't know if we're gonna to get to everything today. I wanna to respect Dr. Goldhammer's time, but we'll certainly get to as many questions as he has time for. And if not, maybe we can invite him back. And for those of you with very complicated medical histories who literally wrote four and five pages, Dr. Goldhammer is gonna show you a way where you can actually get a consult to address some of those more complex issues. Please welcome to the show, one of my heroes in the plant-based world, Dr. Alan Goldhammer. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, AJ, I'm glad to be here. I, am, I don't know if you noticed, but I am wearing a shirt that I don't get to wear very much. It comes with a headband and matching earrings. There's very few places that I can wear this where either people will be delighted by it or understand. So Dr. Goldhammer, the first thing I wanna ask you, how are you personally and True North Health Center and all of Santa Rosa actually doing in general in this age of COVID and with all the fires, are you safe? Yeah, we're actually doing fabulous. We had a little excitement uh, last week with some uh, brush fires and whatnot uh, that produced a lot of smoke. But fortunately, the normal wind patterns in our area come in from the ocean and blow stuff south down to LA where they don't notice as much. So we're actually uh, uh, doing pretty well uh, now and, and they seem to be getting a handle on our on this year's fires uh, in our area. Uh, and as far as uh, uh, COVID is concerned, uh, you know, we've been uh, very fortunate. We've been, you know, it's not been an issue at True North Health Center and we've got a protocol in place to kind of screen patients and, and uh, um, maintain hygienic protocols and whatnot so we can try to minimize the likelihood of, uh, of problems with that and other things, because obviously it's not just COVID, there's also other issues that you get concerned about in groups, including influenza and other problems. Have you, people, what, some of the, okay, what I've kind of done is lump the questions because very often uh, there have been more than one question on a topic, but many people did ask, have you personally seen a lot of people with COVID and do people that truly eat the health promoting diet you recommend, have they gotten it? And if so, how has there been recovery? Um, yeah, people can get uh, infected with uh, viruses, including COVID, even if they're eating healthy. We've certainly seen uh, people that are on healthy diets that have become infected. The difference is that um, some people get exposed to COVID and, and don't even realize that they've been exposed. You can only tell with, with blood testing. Some people have minor symptoms. Some people have major symptoms. And some people get very ill and die. And so one of the things we can look at is what are the differences between the people that uh, get sick and die versus those that have relatively minor recoveries. And a lot of that has to do uh, with the immune system of the individual. People on healthier diets typically, not just with COVID, but other things, tend to recover, uh, have less sequelae, the sequelae tends to resolve more quickly. Uh, people that have certain characteristics are much more vulnerable. And those characteristics for COVID, ironically enough, happen to be metabolic syndrome. So patients that have metabolic syndrome are much more vulnerable to having more serious or even fatal complications should they uh, be exposed and develop uh, infection with COVID. Uh, metabolic syndrome, is when people have uh, increased waist circumference or elevated triglycerides or blood pressure or blood glucose levels or uh, lower HDL levels. So if people have uh, three or more of those characteristics, um, they're diagnosed with metabolic syndrome. Those individuals much more vulnerable to serious consequences, not just to COVID, as I said, but to everything, higher heart attack, higher diabetes risks, et cetera. And so my opinion is that you know, it would be nice to avoid exposure. That's why we wash our hands and we practice social distancing and we wear masks and do all the things that we can do to minimize our exposure. But maybe even more important might be getting serious about it, getting healthier, uh, resolving metabolic syndrome so that should we become exposed to something, we can have a light, high likelihood of recovery and minimum chance of secondary sequelae 
uh, unfortunate secondary effects. So, and that would mean, well, losing weight, normalizing blood pressure and blood sugar levels, uh, reducing the adgenic factors contribute to autoimmune disease. And so that's why we talk about a whole plant food SOS free diet. And if it's appropriate, uh, fasting, because these are the methods we can use to undo the consequence of dietary excess, resolve the metabolic syndrome. And in my opinion, reduce our likelihood of having serious uh, effects from this or other infections. Um, we also are seeing a lot of patients now with what's called post COVID syndrome. So these patients got exposed to COVID, developed a response, recovered from that response. They're now COVID negative. So if you do the blood test, they're negative, but they have some residual secondary effects. Like they may have lost smell or taste. They may have residual fatigue or other issues. And so now what we're doing is applying these diet and lifestyle principles and fasting to those patients. And although we haven't done a study yet, we haven't objectified this data yet, it does appear that patients that are having trouble recovering from some of these symptoms seem to recover much more readily when you tighten up the screws in the diet and use fasting. You mentioned metabolic syndrome, just in case somebody's watching isn't familiar with that term, what is that? So if you have three or more of the following, you will be diagnosed as having metabolic syndrome. If your waist circumference is bigger than 35 inches, if you're a woman or 40 inches, if you're a man, if your triglyceride levels are over 150 milligrams per deciliter, if your blood pressure is over 130 or over 85, uh, if your blood glucose level is over 110, or if your HDL is below 50 milligrams per deciliter, if you have three or more of those characteristics, that would be considered metabolic syndrome. And the thing about metabolic syndrome is that it's strongly tied to everything from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease to liver cancer, to colorectal cancer, to gout, diabetes, stroke, congestive heart failure, myocardial infarction. All of these conditions are strongly correlated with metabolic syndrome. Right. I, I was wondering how was the ritual podcast for you? It's got over a million views. And while you're always a great speaker, I felt that that was a really just a very, very excellent broadcast. Um, well, you know, Roll, Rich Roll is a, is, a, is a really good person and he is, is a good interviewer. He asked really good questions and he has um, an audience of, you know, highly motivated, self-selected uh, people. Many of them are athletically driven and, you know, very bright. We've had uh, just a tremendous response uh, of inquiry from his audience because I think his audience, like your audience, are people that are really serious about getting and staying healthy. And so for us, it turned out to be uh, just a very fortuitous opportunity to share this information. And uh, you know, this information we're talking about, this idea of health from healthful living and whole plant food, SOS free diet and fasting has really gained much more general interest uh, recently uh, than it's in the past. You know, you and I have been talking about this stuff now for many years, but now the whole uh, world seems a little bit more open to some of these ideas and interested in some of these ideas. Yeah, and you recently were on The Doctors. I'll put that link in the show notes. And you're also featured in a Netflix documentary called Unwell. Yes, um, that was an interesting experience. Unwell uh, was originally pitched to us as a show on alternative medicine called Well. And then somewhere along the way, uh, it became Unwell where the focus was uh, really a critical look at alternative medicine. And they tried to present both sides of uh, their perspective. And I think that we were the other side in the sense that I think uh, they were, I think, quite fair in presenting, you know, our views. Uh, but yeah, it's a, you know, the, the real focus, I think, of the show was more of a critical look at some of these alternative uh, methods. Great. Well, let's jump in for the questions. And I appreciate you guys sharing this broadcast right now or afterwards, if you can. This question is from Felicia, who says, I've heard Dr. Lyle say that you were the one that came up with the title of your book, The Pleasure Trap. Are you also the first person to coin that term? And is it synonymous with addiction? In other words, if someone is caught in the pleasure trap or victim of the pleasure trap, is this the same thing as being a food addict or a drug addict? Please explain any similarities or differences. Well, as far as the pleasure trap, yeah, we did some very serious uh, 
look, you know, thinking about what we could call our book. And uh, I did come up with the term, uh, the pleasure trap. And so to be fair to Dr. Lyle, since that was obviously the heavy lifting, I let him actually do the mechanical writing and the production of the rest of the book, because I figured that was only fair to let him have a part as well. So, uh, you know, most of the conceptual development in that book is clearly coming out of that brain of Dr. Doug Lyle, um, who's absolutely, without any qu question, one of the most uh, critical thinkers that, uh, that I've met. And he really came up with a lot of kind of unique and interesting ideas that I think are well expressed in, in that book. Uh, but the pleasure trap, uh, I can actually take, uh, take credit for that part of it. That's great, Whereas, thank you. Um, the, the idea of the pleasure trap is that there's a hidden force that undermines health and happiness, that the artificial stimulation of dopamine in the brain from various forces can lead to an addictive response. It's well recognized with drugs. People recognize people could become addicted to drugs. We introduced this idea that, that certain chemicals that are added to food, particularly salt, oil, and sugar, could also stimulate those same neurochemical pathways and have essentially an addictive type response. And so just like people, when they uh, become addicted to drugs, they, they continue to use drugs, not just to try to feel good, but to avoid feeling very bad, uh, which is kind of a hallmark of addiction. Um, that's also true, it turns out, with these chemicals added to food. When people stop eating sugar, oil, and salt, um, they not only uh, miss the, the good stimulation of dopamine that comes from it, but they actually get a withdrawal type effect that makes it very difficult uh, for people to stop or to stay stopped when it comes to adding these chemicals to their food. So we believe the neurochemistry is very similar. Uh, cocaine may be more powerful in, in, than say sugar in a given dose, but the effects and the consequences seem to be uh, very much uh, similar. We've, we've turned that pleasure trap to kind of encompass the broad spectrum of things that people can become dependent upon. Okay, so 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 when somebody says they're a food addict or they're they can't stop drinking, they are also stuck in the pleasure trap. Yeah, what we would say probably even more accurate description is that they're caught in the dietary pleasure trap, uh, where they're getting this artificial stimulation. It's difficult for them for physiological as well as psychological reasons uh, to make a change. And that's sometimes where fasting can be so beneficial is because you create an environment where that, that um, rebooting of the system can happen dramatically and rather rapidly. And then people can be more in touch with, you know, what we would consider a healthier baseline. Great. As I mentioned, there's many clusters of questions on particular topics. So I'll say the topic and then I'll just read one individual question. This happens to be on water. Many people are asking what kind and how much, but I'll read this question uh, from Fatima. Dr. Goldhammer, can you please clarify what the best type of water to drink and how much we need each day? I'm five foot five inches tall and 120 pounds. And I've heard it said that you should drink half your weight in ounces. I eat a whole food plant-based diet. SOS free, and I'm honestly never thirsty. So should I be forcing myself to drink 60 ounces of water daily? Also, if I drink any liquids after 1 p.m., I'm peeing all night. So is it okay to drink all your liquids in the morning and get it over with? So first of all, um, if you're on a high water content diet, that is a whole plant food diet, you're getting a lot of water uh, in your food and that's distilled water inside the plants. Um, and so people that eat lots of fruits and vegetables don't need to drink as much water as people that are eating, you know, highly processed animal foods and foods with a lot of salt and et cetera. So uh, the amount of water that you drink depends on how much, you know, what your diet uh, water content is and also how much you're exercising and sweating. And if you live in a hot climate, you may lose more fluid through your, um, through your skin than in others. But uh, for most people, uh, they can get most of the water they need from a high water content diet, and then they would supplement that by drinking water. And, you know, one simple little test, if you don't have uh, the ability to do uh, uh, osmolarity of the urine, is you can just look at your urine, uh, particularly in the morning, and say, is it really concentrated? If it's overly concentrated, you know, dark color, uh, strong odor, et cetera, you may be dehydrating a little bit, and it might, you might find uh, some benefit to increasing whatever water intake you are taking uh, to a higher level. Forcing water can be a problem. Too much water, you can actually get water toxicity. You can flush out your electrolytes. You can actually even die if you push it to a great enough extreme. Uh, so you don't wanna be forcing fluids, drinking 
uh, to thirst is usually a reliable indicator. Uh, in fasting patients, we will require a minimal amount of intake and we'll check specific gravity of urine to ensure that they have enough solute in order to be able to have something for their normal detoxification processes to take place. Because remember, your urine is the byproducts of your blood being filtered by your kidneys. That's where most toxins come out, is in your urine. So if you're not drinking enough water so that you can make adequate volumes of urine, you're not gonna be as efficient at detoxifying the body. On the other hand, too much, as I said, you know, you can carry uh, anything to an extreme. So the best water is the purest water you can get. So you can use any purified water. You could use reverse osmosis. You could use uh, solid carbon block filters. You could use lots of things. The most efficient way of purifying water though happens to be steam distillation. So distilled water is what water, rainwater would be if the, if the atmosphere wasn't so polluted. Um, distilled water doesn't leach the body of all your minerals. It's not the two-way gradient that's suggested that sucks all the minerals out of your bones and stuff. You get all the minerals you need from your diet. You don't need to be getting additional minerals uh, from the, the water in order to meet your mineral needs. And more importantly, there's a lot of stuff in water, including municipal water that you don't want. Hydrogen and halocarbons that, and form from organic materials. There's um, parasites. There's all kinds of things that, uh, cryptosporidium, et cetera, that can show up in water that we want to avoid. So we recommend highly purified water, whatever system you want to use, but probably the most efficient system is distillation. Terrific. Thank you. If there's ever, ever a question you don't want to answer, please feel free to not answer it because this one is about vaccines. Uh, Faith says, does eating a whole food plant-based diet, exercising and sleeping well reduce the risk of contracting the flu or COVID-19 this season? And should people eating a healthy diet get the flu vaccine? And if a COVID vaccine becomes available, one of those as well. Okay, so when we talk about vaccines, let's let's look at some numbers. With influenza, we, you know, we don't know as much about COVID right now because that's, first of all, the vaccine hasn't even been uh, introduced and we don't know what its effectiveness is gonna be. But let's look at influenza, which we do know a little bit more about. And we know that a, uh, typically a person has about a 2% chance of getting influenza or one in 50 population as a whole in any given year. And that a immunized person has about a 1% chance of getting uh, a, a difference. So there is a 1% reduction in the likelihood of getting influenza if you're immunized. And even though that doesn't sound like very much, you know, two per hundred or one per hundred, it's, it's enough uh, supposedly to have a help, a help societally with herd, herd immunity, et cetera. The problem is there are some potential prices that are paid anytime we do uh, vaccination, including influenza vaccination, particularly when thimerosal mercury-based preservatives are used as a part of the formulation. So there's some concerns about that. There have been other concerns about potential negative effects. We know that some people, relatively rare people, have very untoward reactions and, and some die or become uh, neurologically debilitated, but that's rare. Uh, and the argument is that the rare chance of a serious side effect is outweighed by the societal benefit of reducing, you know, maximizing herd immunity, reducing spread of influenza. So those, those issues can all be debated. And I doubt that they'll be much different when it comes to COVID-19, that there'll be some potential side effects there'll be some purported social benefit and people will have to decide if the risk uh, is worth the reward on any given you know, medical treatment. The one thing I would argue is the best person to decide that is likely to be the patient and their doctor, not necessarily a government bureaucratic official somewhere. So you know, I would argue that whatever you decide to do, you should probably do it you know, fully educated and informed and not just um, as a result of you know, political infighting. Terrific. So we have a whole slew of questions on water fasting at home. So some people are saying they cannot afford to go to True North, they cannot get there. And people want to know, is it safe to water fast at home? And for how long? Absolutely. Uh, water fasting should be done and can be done by every patient every day um, at home. And we recommend, depending on your goals, that that period of fasting be ranged from 12 to 16 hours every day. And the way we recommend that people do that is number one, stop eating three hours before your normal bedtime. Now that doesn't mean stay up till 3 a.m. because uh, you're eating at midnight. It means take your normal bedtime, subtract three hours from that and have that be the time that you stop eating. And then don't eat again 
uh, you know, until you're ready to break your fast with something that's often called breakfast. And that time will depend on how long your fasting period is going to be. If you're trying to lose weight or you're trying to maintain weight, a good period for many people is 16 hours of fasting every day. So you limit your feeding window to eight hours. If you're trying to gain weight or maybe you're, uh, have a high caloric needs, you're, you know, a competitive athlete, whatever, you're burning a lot of calories, then it might be better to have a 10 or 12 hour um, feeding window and, a, and a, an appropriate fasting window, maybe 12 hours, so that you have enough hours to get enough of this low caloric density, high nutrient density food into your diet. So the, the person that is trying to maintain weight or lose weight, we would recommend eight hours of feeding, 16 hours of fasting each and every day. Now, what that does is it allows you to induce some of these changes associated with fasting and cumulatively, according to Walter Longo and others, that cumulative benefit is thought to be substantial. Also, some people suggest that by using these intermittent fasting protocols, it may help people avoid overeating. So everybody should fast short period of time every day. And then I believe that there's some benefit in patients every once in a while taking some time out and doing a longer water only fast. Now, the duration of that longer fast is going to be dependent on the person and the results of their medical history, their physical examination, and laboratory testing. We also believe that in addition to be properly screened and evaluated and having baseline data established, we recommend monitoring during the fasting process and being in a controlled setting uh, where activities can be limited. So you make sure you maximize fat mobilization and the detoxification that goes along with that and minimize gluconeogenesis or protein mobilization. And because that's exactly what happens when people try to do prolonged fasting, but remain too active. They force their bodies to produce more glucose by breaking down protein. And as a consequence, they don't get the detoxification and some of the real benefits that they would um, having done fasting properly. In our experience, water fasting for prolonged periods of time um, is much better done in a controlled setting. Now let's say you can't do that. Well, that's fine, don't. Focus on intermittent fasting every single day, eating a whole plant food SOS free diet every single day. And yes, it may take longer, but many problems will resolve themselves without ever having to come to the True North Health Center. In fact, you know, we have this new uh, phone coaching service that we use. And uh, one of our doctors, uh, Dr. Chilla Veras, does a whole lot of uh, phone coaching with patients. And um, she's had hundreds of people that she's worked with. And I keep giving her a hard time because more and more frequently I'm getting patients that were planning to come to the center, but they had to wait a couple months because we were booked up or whatever. And by the time it's time for them to come in, they're already better. So they've show, they followed her advice, she's done the diet, and now we don't even necessarily have to bring them in for the blood pressure or the, or the blood sugar levels that we were gonna treat them for because she, they've already come good. And so as annoying it is to me in terms of messing up the baseline data, the reality is we're actually quite pleased to see that health really does result from healthful living. Fasting can be a useful tool to speed it up. There are some conditions that really require it in order to recover. But for most people, the whole point is to get the diet, sleep, and exercise right. And if you do that, then the need for fasting oftentimes is reduced uh, dramatically. Right, but you're not recommending that people do extended non-supervised water fasts at home like you do at True North, correct? I recommend that all long-term fasting be done after there's been a history exam and lab done and it be done under supervision of a doctor that is familiar with fasting supervision. Right. Now, there are some patients that we're working with, for example, that can't come to the center, they can't get uh, permits right now. You know, like for example, Canadians. Right now, I think, what are they, building a wall between us and Canada to keep the Americans out, you know? Um, and, and some places in the Middle East where people can't get visas. And I've been working with some physicians that are fasting their patients and I'll, and I'll assist the physicians and give them the guidance they need. And we do that uh, happily. So if you have a doctor that wants to monitor you every day and, and do that, we'll give those doctors advice, but we wouldn't recommend patients do that on their own because they really do need to have the benefit of appropriate monitoring in order to make it safe and effective. Right, because some of the people writing say they like to water fast two days a week and they're doing it just for weight loss. Well, you know, for weight loss, we believe a more effective strategy would be to fast every day for 16 hours, eat for eight hours, engage in regular aerobic exercise. And I think that's going to work better than doing a very brief uh, uh, 24 or 40 hour water only fast, which is really more biologically expensive because a lot of the weight you're losing is going to be from gluconeogenesis and breaking down protein. You don't want to break down your protein, you just want to break down your fat. And one beautiful thing we've learned about fasting 
uh, with the benefit of our new DEXA scanner is that it appears that fasting preferentially mobilizes visceral fat. In fact, we're doing a study right now, AJ, on body composition. Well, we're gonna to put to rest a lot of the old wives' tales that are out there because we're actually analyzing people before, after, and then on follow-up in six weeks to show exactly what happens to the amount of visceral fat, subcutaneous fat, muscle, fiber, water, glycogen changes that occur in the body, not only during fasting, but in recovery, and then on follow-up. That's amazing. Are there some people who just absolutely should not fast under any circumstances? Absolutely. There's a wide variety of conditions and individuals that are poor candidates for fasting. And that's one of the important things we do uh, when patients call the center for their, their free phone screening as we go through their history and, and take a look to make sure that they're even a candidate uh, for doing this type of a thing. And sometimes they may not be a candidate for water only fasting, but there may be a modified program that might be appropriate for them. So for example, let's say for example, people are on some medications and it might take a while to wean them off their medication. We know that water only fasting is not compatible with most medication use. That can be a very serious problem. So we might put together a program where they're on six or 800 calories of vegetable base and or fruit based juices and broths and things that would allow them to continue to use their medication safely but get some of the benefits that are associated with this uh, fasting mimicking program. Great. So you had mentioned that for weight loss, a 16, eight hour window is effective. There's a lot of people in the plant-based space. Now, some of them dietitians and even doctors that are narrowing it even more to like one meal a day or four hours. Would you say that's a little bit too extreme for most people? Well, I'm not sure it's the most effective for most people. It may be an appropriate intervention, at least for a time with some people. But the problem is a lot of the things that are good for short-term weight loss are not necessarily for long, good for long-term health. The 16-8 uh, fasting feeding window works well on a long-term sustainable basis. You can keep people on that essentially indefinitely. Um, the only reason, the only people that are poor candidates for that are people where you just have to get more food into them in order to meet their caloric needs. So for people that are eating the 2000 calories that is more the 2,500 calorie type of diet, that works really well. Because if you fill up the human feeding bag, the stomach um, with low density, high nutrition foods, you know, you're getting five, six, 700 calories each time you do that. And of these low density foods. And as a consequence, you have to fill it up two or three times a day to get enough to eat. Now, if you're in an active weight loss program and you only fill it up once or twice a day, well, fine, you know, you're still getting calories and you're going to lose weight. But at some point, you're gonna reach your optimum weight and you're gonna to have to fill it up a little bit more in order to sustain that weight. So there is a lot of individual variation. Some people are highly efficient. They gain weight very easily. They absorb everything they eat. Other people not so efficient. So they need, you know, you have to modify the number, the frequency and the quantity based on the individual uh, that you're talking about. Great, thank you. Let's see, uh, Sharon says, is a juice fast effective for resetting the palate in detoxing or does it not do very much? And how many days should somebody do a juice fast for optimal benefits? Well, I'm actually a bigger fan of getting people to eat just an exclusively whole plant food diet, pre preferably maybe just fruit and vegetables even, where you do raw and or cooked vegetables and fruits. And I find that the palate will re-adapt on that type of a program. The thing about juices is they're easily palatable. They're very powerful because they're really high in sugar. You know, you've ripped the cells apart you've, and you're uh, exposing large amounts of sugar to the tongue all at once. And so it's very pleasant for people. People maybe wouldn't be willing to eat fruits and vegetables because their palates have been perverted. They might be willing to drink the juices. And if they do that for some days, they may begin to get this neuroadaptation, taste adaptation where, you know, good foods start to taste better. So I don't have a fundamental objection to people doing juices. I just don't know that it's always the best strategy as uh, compared to the same amount of calories, but coming from whole food, they include the fiber that maintain bowel function and they're teaching people to eat healthier. Now we do use juices when we come off the fast, but that's for therapeutic reasons. When we break a water fast, we wanna introduce food slowly and not put too much fiber in right away till the system can fire up. And so we'll do a day of juice for every week of fasting, just as a way of kind of getting the body back into that feeding mode. And certainly people use juicing and or uh, smoothies successfully on these modified feeding regimes. Again, convenience, palatability are two of the reasons people do it. But honestly, the best results are often just getting people eating a whole plant food diet, lots of sleep, plenty of exercise. And let's face it, what do we expect? If you're a male, 
you're going to lose three pounds a week. If you're a female, you're going to lose about two pounds a week. And, you know, two pounds a week is 100 pounds a year. I'm not sure you need to speed it up faster than that generally. Great. Thank you. If someone can't afford a place like True North and is struggling to get out of the pleasure trap but lives with an unsupportive family who constantly brings junk in the house, what are the best things the person can do? Well, you know, these are really kinds of questions that Dr. Lyle is really best at answering in terms of how do you deal with uh, relatives that are undermining your success? I'd suggest we first change the topic from the diet to say alcohol. Let's say you're a recovering alcoholic but your family insists on bringing alcohol in and having open containers all around the house and all that. I think what you'd need to do is sit down with your family and explain to them that, you know, you're an addict and you're trying to beat your addiction so that you can have a decent life and that you would really value and benefit from their cooperation. Now you're not telling them, for example, that they can't have a drink, but you'd prefer that they not drink around you or have it available to you readily because, you know, you're having trouble resisting. it. And I think most um, people would not say, oh, you know, that's your problem, not my problem. You know, why should I have to give up boozing just because you're, you know, a drunk or whatever. Most of people I think would be try to be supportive and, and maybe restrict their alcohol consumption out of the, uh, the um, view of, the, of the, the loved one. And maybe they might even be willing to give up themselves just to be supportive and helpful. Uh, I don't think that's unreasonable uh, to be asking for a safe environment. And the same thing's true people struggling with weight. If you're struggling with weight, I don't think it's unreasonable to ask your loved ones to assist you by restricting their uh, indulgence in their pleasure trap foods away from you so that you can be supported in trying to make these changes. Um, but, you know, I understand not everybody agrees with that, but, you know, in my opinion, uh, they're wrong and I'm right. <laughs> and you also have said that you assess a person's intelligence by how much they agree with you. And I agree with everything you've ever said. What I actually said, the real quote is that I evaluate other researchers intelligence by how much they agree with us. And that those that agree with us are obviously geniuses. Thank you. You know, you'd be surprised though, how many people aren't supportive. You would think a family member or a spouse would be, but it's, it's quite the opposite we're finding. So what I found though, is there's a strong correlation between family support and success. When I look at long-term compliance and adherence issues, if there's a strong uh, family support, it makes a huge difference. And that doesn't mean everybody has to eat just like you're eating. Everybody else doesn't have to do just what you're doing. They just have to be willing to be supportive of you being successful. If they're frankly antagonistic, it doesn't mean you can't succeed, but you have to work a lot harder at it. It's just like you don't take an alcoholic and tell them, well, the first job you should do is become a bartender. You know, usually you try to help them create an environment that's supportive of their change. <clears throat> and honestly, AJ, what I'm seeing is more of a problem even than the family is when people are having to go to work where people are not so supportive of their you know, desires. At least at home, maybe people might be a little bit respectful, but at work, you know, the candy bowls and the, all that stuff is sometimes really, really difficult. And all the social pressure that goes along with it is really challenging for patients uh, to resist. And, you know, we, we noticed that early on, we said that, you know, people at the center scene did not have that much trouble. They enjoyed the food and they were losing weight. But when they went home, sometimes they struggled. So my suggestion was, let's just not let them go home anymore. We'll just keep people at the center indefinitely. And then we'll get really good long-term adherence. Dr. Lyle says that wasn't practical or appropriate socially. So instead, what we've done is we've tried to figure out systems for supporting people when they go home. Like for example, referring them to programs like yours, where people are able to get ongoing social support. And apparently for those individuals um, that respond to social support, it's been highly effective. We've also implemented a phone coaching service where people can actually log on through our website at healthpromoting.com and actually click on uh, the attending uh, doctor or the, or the educator of their choice, and they can actually set up um, a direct Zoom-based or phone uh, coaching link. And we are hoping that that's going to uh, assist people in providing ongoing support. We've also just launched our own Roku channel, which is uh, True North TV on Roku. And all of our supportive videos are now freely available on through that Roku channel or through our website. And we're about to launch a new service where people are able to go through our website and then participate in our twice daily question and answer sessions that we offer with our doctors at the True North Health Center. 
So not only will the patients at the center be able to participate in that, but patients at home are gonna be able to participate in that or anybody that's interested in actually uh, hearing what we have to say, will be able to log on without any cost and participate uh, in our um, uh, educational sessions that go on every day at the True Health Center. Great, and I'll be posting the links to the, the phone coaching as well as to the ritual podcast so people can see that as well. Okay. Is there any amount of alcohol consumption that is safe? And if so, what is the maximum amount? Absolutely. The alcohol consumption that's absolutely safe is zero. So it, there's no difference in any other highly addictive drug. The less you consume, the better. The best is none. Now, does that mean that a person, everybody that has a drink is going to become a drunk? No. There are some people that could consume small amounts of alcohol and not become physically addicted to it. It doesn't mean it's healthy for them. They're still having to deal with all the negative effects of the alcohol. I mean, when people drink a lot of alcohol, they get cirrhosis of the liver. The fatty infiltrate, the, the scar tissue that forms is a consequence of the liver having to detoxify this nasty stuff. But in small enough quantity, some people can get it and not have an immediate secondary effect. But for example, if you're an alcoholic, how much can you drink? Well, none, because any amount of alcohol can stimulate a cascading uh, chain of events that's undesirable. So what about cheese and chocolate and processed foods? Can somebody have a small amount of that and not become obese? Absolutely. But if you're already obese, it's probably not you that should be doing that. Because if you could have controlled it, you likely would have controlled it. And the fact that you can't, it, uh, it just reflects that you're going to find it easier to just avoid it altogether than you are to continually tease yourself with it. And I think this is the problem is not everybody's the same. Some people can have something and then they don't think about it again for a month. Somebody else has the same substance and that's all they can think about for a month. And so you have to know yourself enough to know, is, is this something uh, that you could do? But just because you could do it doesn't mean you should do it. So even if you are the person that can occasionally do this or do that and not become caught in the pleasure trap, that doesn't mean it's desirable. In fact, it may be highly undesirable even though you think you're getting away with it. Great, well, now that you mentioned alcohol, we must ask about caffeine. And what are your thoughts on caffeine, specifically in coffee and green tea with regard to the purported health benefits? Because a lot of the doctors are saying now it helps prevent stroke, it helps prevent Alzheimer's. And if somebody is addicted to caffeine, what, what steps would you recommend? Isn't it true that water fasting helps them get over those headaches quicker? Well, it is true that the withdrawal, first of all, caffeine is a highly addictive nervous system drug. And so, you know, definitely a nasty addictive drug. The side effects from its withdrawal are quite severe. We ask people to discontinue these drugs even before they get to the center, just because their withdrawals are so nasty. Um, and, you know, in headaches and other symptoms. So uh, caffeine should be avoided. And it's particularly noxious that we're giving it to children. You know, we put this highly addictive drug in foods and disguise it with in chocolate and colas and, and things and, and don't even realize that we're starting this whole cycle of uh, drug exposure, uh, even when people are very young. And unfortunately, even some foods that may otherwise be, uh, you know, uh, somewhat healthful are still naturally contaminated by caffeine. So uh, the green teas and other things I'd recommend against just because I think the negative effect of caffeine outweighs whatever uh, benefit might be present because you are dealing with a plant-based food. All plant-based foods have health promoting aspects. You know, they try to tell you that red wine is healthy because it's got resveratrol and a, a powerful antioxidant, which comes from the skin of grapes. What I'd rather they tell people is they should eat some grapes if they want the powerful antioxidants and they don't have to drink this uh, highly processed substance that uh, leads to so much death, premature death and devastation. Great. Thank you. Let's see. There is a big debate right now with some of the younger plant-based doctors about the health benefits of extra virgin olive oil. Is it detrimental to health or is it okay in small amounts for most people? Yeah, extra virgin. I mean, so oil is oil, nine calories per gram, highly fractionated food byproduct that is fools the satiety mechanism and then leads people to obesity and health compromise. So I, Dr. Um, McDougal likes to say that, you know, you, the, the fat you eat is the fat you wear and you can take a fat biopsy of a person and tell which type of uh, fat that they've been consuming because it is absorbed so efficiently and effectively uh, into the body. So uh, whether it, your olive oil is uh, extra virgin or it's highly experienced, I think that it still is detrimental and should be avoided. 
Uh, the fact that virgin olive oil may be somewhat less health compromising than some other oil for various processing characteristics doesn't make it good. Something doesn't become good just because it's less bad. I agree. Thank you. And even, I mean, it's just so calorically dense. This is what I'm not understanding why they're promoting it. I tell patients if they want olive oil, just rub it all over their belly and hips. And then when they're done, they can wash it off and they don't have to carry it around all week. Well, that's interesting because we do have a question about, is it okay to put oil on your skin like coconut oil or will it be absorbed? There is some absorption, but I think it's relatively small. And so I don't know that there's actually a, a health compromising consequence. Although there is some absorption that takes place through the skin, I think it's relatively limited. So I don't think it would be a, a major uh, concern. Great, thank but, you. you know, the thing is, if you're having to put a lot of oil on your skin, it may be that there's something from the inside out that's not being fully addressed. So I would certainly you know, wanna make sure that it's not making up for the lack of eating a health promoting diet or you know, maintaining hydration, et cetera. Terrific. What are the best steps to take if you have been out of the pleasure trap for a while, but then slip back into it? I'd say get on a plane, go to True North. Well, it's very easy to get into the pleasure trap because everywhere you go, people are trying to give you what you want, not what you need. And it's very, you know, it's a very alluring and difficult process. Staying out of the pleasure trap is perhaps one of the most difficult things people do in our society today. And so what you can do though, is try not to get into the all or nothing mentality. If you, if you choose to indulge in something, I suggest paying really close attention, not just to the short-term pleasure-seeking self-indulgent response that you get from the stimulation of the drug-like effect, but also how you feel in the hours and the days uh, that follow. And many times people find they just don't feel as good or as sharp after they've indulged in these things as they do when they, you know, when they, when they're living healthfully and all you have to do, if you're able to is get back on track, start eating a whole plant food diet, get the, get enough rest and exercise. And over time, your body will narrow a doubt. If you find you've become uh, really caught in the pleasure trap and you just don't have what it takes to get out of it, you can either call and talk to, uh, in, you know, participate in the support groups, call and talk to one of our coaches or, uh, come and join us at the True North Health Center and we'll be happy to help you get back on track. Uh, I think, uh, I don't know if it was you, AJ, or somebody else that said that gave us the nickname True North Health Center, the last resort. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we, we prefer to not have to be the last resort. And I have to say, we are, you used to see people motivated by pain, debility, and fear of death. And that was it. Those are the people we saw. And now we're seeing a lot of healthy people that are using us proactively trying to stay healthy or using us maybe to kind of get back on track or just reboot the system a little bit. So, um, you know, if you can do it on your own, the best way to do it is just to go get right back on track and don't beat yourself up over the fact that you, you've done a little experiment because the way I look at it, the reason I don't get mad at patients is because I feel like they're trying to prove I'm right. So if you get off track and you feel like crap, that doesn't bother me. That feel, that's great. Now you've got more reinforcement. The worst problem is that people get off track and they don't notice it right away. Then sometimes by the time they realize what they've done, they're really hopelessly caught in the pleasure trap. Great. The next one is nutritional yeast and carob powder. Are they unhealthy in any way? Well, you know, carob powder usually isn't just served as raw carob powder. It's usually roasted, uh, which means you're using heat with a high fat food. And it's usually they add oil, salt, and sugar to it because frankly, it doesn't taste that good unless you, 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 you know, uh, mix it all up with all the other ingredients. So although raw carob powder probably wouldn't necessarily be the end of the world, I don't know that it's particularly that utilitarian uh, in, as a part of our diet. And um, what was the other one that you asked? Uh, about? Nutritional yeast. Oh, well, yeast is, a, is a, really a food byproduct. You know, it's actually a, a single cell organism. And uh, it has a fermentive uh, uh, tendency in some people's digestive tract. So it gives them gas and makes them not feel so good. It's a very concentrated food, uh, essentially animalcule, if you will. And so uh, we're trying to avoid the really excess protein intake, even in our, our vegan vegetarian patients. So I wouldn't use it as a uh, nutritional supplement or some kind of magic food factor where you use large quantities of it. If you happen to like that rather disgusting flavor, and you wanted to sprinkle it on something as a flavor enhancement, I don't know that it's the end of the world. I certainly wouldn't see it as uh, health promoting or some kind of health food. I'd look at it like I would say any spice or 
additive. I don't particularly, I'm not particularly attracted to that particular flavor, but if you are and you use a small enough quantity and it doesn't cause you gas and it doesn't create a problem, you don't mind including a small amount of highly fractionated food product in the diet, I guess it wouldn't be the absolute end of the world. It gives me such abdominal pain. Good. Well, then we don't have to have this discussion. You just don't eat it. No, I don't. I don't. So, yeah. Neither do I. We don't serve it at the True North Health Center either. So. Right. Let's see. What are your thoughts on eating rice and the risk of arsenic contamination? So, you know, the people that should be worrying about biological concentration of chemicals in foods are people eating animal foods. Because animal foods uh, do an incredibly efficient job of concentrating the materials from the environment into their cells. So if you look at, uh, say, a calorie of a typical plant food compared to a calorie of animal foods, that animal food could have two to a, even a thousand times the concentration of biologically accumulated materials. So the biggest risk is going to be people eating the chicken, the fish, the meat. The, you know, these are the people that should be most concerned about this concept. Now, it is true that some plants do a more efficient job of concentrating some of the potential contaminants from the environment. Rice is one of those. The way that rice is uh, grown um, it has a higher potential for absorbing contaminants that might be in the soil than maybe some other plants do. So if you buy rice that's been raised on uh, land that used to raise cotton and they use arsenic-based pesticides, you may have a higher concentration of arsenic in the rice than you would maybe some other types of foods. Now, whether that's biologically significant, uh, if, whether it compromises health, I don't know that that uh, data is clear. However, we have other options. We can buy rice, for example, California rice that's organically grown is grown on so that where they've never raised cotton and the contamination of uh, those soils with arsenic is much less. And as a consequence, there'd be less of a concern using those rices. And also if you cook rice like you would pasta, you know, five to one instead of two to one ratios of water, the, the concentration of uh, minerals, including arsenic is dramatically reduced. Now you also reduce your risk of other healthy nutrients. So, you know, I'm not necessarily advocating that, uh, but there's things you can do to minimize your exposure, preferably buying organically grown rice from areas that don't have contaminated, arsenic contaminated soils. Um, but I'll tell you what, the benefit of eating even organically grown brown rice compared to the alternative source of calories is so much that I really think this is more of a um, academic argument than it is a, a, a great clinical concern for the majority of people. Um, that we're dealing with. All right. I know you've mentioned Lundberg might be a good brand. We use Lundberg rice. Uh, they, they do a good job. They're a good company. They focus, have a lot of organic acreage. They are California based. And so, you know, we feel comfortable with them. We buy large quantities of that. And we do include that as part of the grains we, we serve to people that are eating grains. We don't use glutinous grains at True North. So we don't use wheat, rye, or barley. We don't use any of the products that come from those. Uh, but we do include rice and millet and quinoa and other grains. And for those of you that are concerned, you don't have to eat rice. You don't have to eat any, any particular individual food. You can just eat more starchy vegetables, eat more potatoes and sweet potatoes and squash. And, you know, there's some advantages to that. These starchy vegetables are lower caloric density. Uh, and so for people on weight uh, management programs, it's sometimes easier to achieve and maintain their weight by including more, mostly starchy vegetables and not the more concentrated uh, grains. Uh, in the diet. Some people don't do well with grains. They just don't do well with them. And so we don't, we can exclude those entirely from the diet and still get all the protein, calories, fiber, fats, vitamins, minerals that you need in order to sustain optimum health. Well, no, there is a belief that you have to eat certain foods like beans, like nuts, or you're not a good vegan and, and you'll drop dead. And one of these questions from Janet is, Beans bloat me a lot and give me a lot of gas, so I don't eat them. My starches are sweet potatoes, winter squash potatoes, and an occasional gluten-free grain. Grain. Am I truly missing out on tons of other nutrients like the other whole food plant-based doctors say because I don't eat beans? Well, no, I think that you can eat a very uh, healthy diet with a good, con uh, good combination of all the nutrients, even if beans can't be a part of the diet. The advantage of the beans, they are very concentrated in nutrition. And if you can prepare them in a way or, or select the varieties that you're able to digest, I think that's nice. It adds variety to the diet. People enjoy it. But for those that are not able to enjoy beans, I don't think you have to worry that you're not going to be able to achieve and maintain long-term health. Uh, one of the big advantages of the beans is they're very cost-effective, which is why they're used so extensively throughout the world. Because you know a lot of a lot of um, uh, nutrient per cost, so they're cheap. But that doesn't uh, mean that everybody's going to do well with them. And some people might do okay with say 
sprouted lentils, but they wouldn't do well with eating heavy beans or they, you know, there may be certain classes of beans that you can handle. Some people, if they soak the beans, they boil them and drain them and then they cook them slowly, eat small enough quantities, they're able to digest them properly. Whereas other people just can't touch, you know, just don't do well with them at all. Yep, thanks. Okay, uh, there is a lot of questions about salt, a lot. And so I'm gonna summarize and then I'm gonna actually read you two of them because these are the, these are the perspectives. People basically wanna know, are coconut aminos okay? Are fermented foods okay? If, if they are people that are of normal weight, they do not have hypertension. And so let me just read you a couple of the questions so you know what the people are talking about. So Lori says she eats a whole food plant-based diet without oil and sugar, but, and she doesn't struggle with overeating. She has a normal VMI, but she likes her food to taste good and feels that a bit of salt added to the beans, sauces, and condiments accomplishes that. If it doesn't lead to overeating, is it still harmful? What specifically does a bit of added salt do to the diet and to the gut microbiome? And Stephanie says the chem her chemical of choice is salt. She hasn't eaten sugar in years. No oil is easy, but salt is very hard. She is a low BMI, not a food addict. Can she still uh, consume a small amount? And other than coming to True North for fasting, is there practical advice for eliminating salt? So I guess people want to know, is a little bit okay? Let's talk about salt. Number one, uh, salt is an essential nutrient and without sodium, you die. Uh, and you get all the sodium you need, just like you get all the sugar you need and all the oil you need as a part of whole natural food diet. So you do not need to add salt, oil, and sugar to the diet in order to get the sodium chloride, the essential fatty acids, um, and the carbohydrates that you need in order to sustain health. Um, the disadvantage of salt is that it's a powerful stimulant of passive overeating. So whether it's animals or humans, if you just have them eat to satiety till they feel naturally full, they'll eat a certain amount of whatever it is. If you take everything else being equal, you salt up the food, they'll eat more before they feel satiated, before they feel satisfied. So when people eat salt out of their food, they tend to eat more than they would if they ate the exact same food without the salt. Now, some people say, yeah, because it tastes better. Well, of course, because what is tasting better but stimulating dopamine production in the brain? And dopamine is the neurochemical associated with pleasure. So the more dopamine, the more pleasure, the more you like the food. That doesn't mean you can't like the food without the salt, but it takes, you have to neuroadapt to that. It takes about a month on a low sodium diet to get used to eating a low sodium diet. And once you do, then the same amount of salt that you used to quote like now it tastes overwhelming. You know, if, if you were I age, you went into a restaurant and could find a vegan soup, you'd likely find it to be unpalatable because there's so much salt that's routinely used that for us, it would be um, distasteful. And that's exactly what happens to patients after fasting is they try to eat the old stuff they used to like, and it's just too much because they've adapted. We actually did a study on taste adaptation and showed there is in fact a change that occurs in perception uh, to taste. And so if we're trying to maintain weight, the less added salt you use, the, easy, the easier it's going to be in order to maintain weight because you're going to be less vulnerable to passive overeating. Also, salt is a natural preservative. Think about what do we, when we salt meat, what's that to do? It's to kind of keep the bacteria from breaking it down to preserve it because it kills off the bacteria. Well, when you eat a high salt diet, you have five pounds of bacteria living in your intestinal tract. Five pounds of creatures, a trillion of them, eating, drinking, and defecating inside your intestinal tract. And so when you eat a high salt diet, you get a different type of microflora, a different type of microbiome than you would if you are eating a healthier diet. And that, that difference is when we're just learning the significance of that. So I can't say with definitive which ones change and how much and all that, but the, the concern is that we're altering the microflora and affecting not just digestion, but immunity as a consequence of this excess amount of sodium that people are eating. We know for sure that the higher the sodium intake, the more vulnerable you are to things like high blood pressure. You know, I've uh, treated thousands of patients with high blood pressure, and I've learned that one of the most important things is to control sodium intake. And if you control how much sodium intake uh, the person's consuming, you can often control the blood pressure without the need for medication. So there's a lot of reasons why, just like sugar is a problem and people have come to accept that, and oil is a problem, and now some people are coming to accept that, salt is also a problem. This is the same stuff that we've been talking about now for 36 years. Now, in the past, everybody argued, oh, no, oil was good, and you had to have oil, and people would argue refined carbohydrates are good and you got to have sugar. And now people are still fighting this salt business. But I predict that as more and more research is done, 
ultimately people will come to realize that SOS free diets are in fact the diets that most promote long-term sustained health. And I think it's the easiest one if you're suffering from food addictions. You just, otherwise you're just teasing yourself. Yeah. It is no question. There are patients that find it's a lot easier to just not eat the stuff that they're struggling with than it is to continue to kind of try to have to deal with that ongoing battle. You know, eventually you just get tired of it. And sometimes it's easier just to let it all go. Well, I learned everything I know about nutrition. I learned from you. And I, even when I'm a chef, I wear one of two aprons, this one or this one <laughs> as a tribute to you. People worry though about iodine when they don't have salt and they're asking if they need to supplement with uh, iodine. It's an essential nutrient. Uh, normally you get all the iodine you need from you know, plant-rich diet. Now remember, there's not a huge quantities in most plant-based foods, but there's a little bit. And because you're eating a lot of plant-based foods, you get enough iodine. Now, some plants are really rich in iodine. And so, for example, things like, you know, sea vegetables like kelp or nori or other things. And so even the smallest amount of those provides abundant amounts of iodine. Um, the people that conceivably could get into trouble with iodine are those that are eating foods that are grown on iodine deficient soil. So if you lived in, say, Minnesota and all your food came from your Minnesota soil, unless you supplemented that soil with iodine, you would have likely iodine deficient soil and ultimately iodine deficient plants. Now, because we get plants from all over the world nowadays that are grown on all kinds of soils, most uh, plants have enough iodine to meet most people's needs. They added iodine to salt because they, you know, noticed that we're having problems with people on highly refined carbohydrate diets uh, that were developing iodine deficiency. So for most vegetarians, they do fine. The good news is if you're worried about that, it's simple enough. You can supplement iodine just like you would B12. You can add sea vegetables to the diet, um, or it's not that easy to do testing because it's a challenge test. It's not a simple uh, blood test. Uh, but the point is, um, lots of options to, to deal with this issue, either in the diet or in, in supplemental nutrition, uh, even if iodine issues do uh, become a reality. But people are saying that some of the plant-based doctors recommend miso and fermented foods, which have salt for gut health. Yeah, I don't agree with that. The fermented foods, I don't have a problem with fermented foods per se, but we'd want it done without the salt. So you can have pickles without salt if you do them yourself. You can have sauerkraut and these things. And, and we serve some of that. I don't know how therapeutic the fermentation process actually will turn out to be, but it's, it is a natural preservative. If people enjoy that flavor, uh, you know, I don't have a fundamental objection to it, but you don't need to get those super salt saturated materials in order to be able to enjoy uh, the diversity that uh, fermented foods provide. And it's right. not the salt in that that's thought to be the beneficial effect. It's the, it's the bacterial fermentation that's thought to be, uh, you know, potentially helpful. Great. Dr. Goldhammer, I want to respect your time. We've gone almost an hour. <laughs> and hardly gotten past the stack. Should I keep going for a little bit? Well, I'm happy to, to go on if you want, or I'm happy we can, we can maybe we'll set up another time in yeah. the future to, to handle additional questions, but I, I certainly am happy to go okay. on. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll let you be the guide when you feel like it's enough. Why don't you just say to me last question? How's that? Okay. Okay. And of course you're welcome back. Just like Dr. Lyle, I'd make a place on my calendar for you once a month, every other, whatever you like. So there are a lot of questions on thyroid disease, hypothyroidism specifically. And most of them are like the ones from Monica, who's saying the podcast was amazing. She watched it twice. And she says, is water only fasting an option to help someone with subclinical hypothyroidism reduce or eliminate the need for medication? I'm currently taking 50 micrograms of levothyroxine. And then other people like Laurel wrote in saying she was already following SOS free whole food plant-based and now was just diagnosed with hypothyroidism. So people want to know what to do. Okay. So thyroid is complicated. Um, there's a gene called the HLA-DQ gene, which is common in people with hypothyroidism. And that gene that's associated with Hashimoto's thyroiditis is also a gene that's associated with gluten sensitivity. And there are some theories that people that happen to have gluten sensitivity, but don't have celiac disease, and their, their immune system isn't attacking their colon. The immune system in some patients occurs to attack the thyroid and they call it Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And in those patients, they may benefit by eliminating wheat and other uh, glutinous grains that uh, may stimulate that autoimmune attack. And we've also noticed that dairy proteins and other factors seem to be associated with increasing these symptoms. So for a new onset hypothyroid patient, sometimes by 
getting their diet right, making sure they have adequate iodine intake, that they've got no, get rid of the gluten, get, make sure everything is going right. Sometimes it will normalize their thyroid function. We definitely see that it's relatively easy to monitor thyroid function, T3, T4, T7, et cetera. Um, some people though, that have been on thyroid replacement for over 10 years, for example, rarely will improve enough to eliminate the need for thyroid replacement entirely. What we do with fasting is we often will reduce thyroid medication during fasting and then retest. And if a person continues to improve, we'll try to wean them off their meds. If they need more then we'll appropriately treat them. You want to be on the least amount of thyroid medication necessary to maintain optimal function. If you're on too much thyroid medication, it actually is associated with osteoporosis and other problems. So there's negative side effects. On the other hand, you don't want to be hypothyroid because then you feel like crap. It's not a good thing. And so you want that perfect balance. Fortunately, the doctors at the True North Health Center are trained not only in conventional uh, management strategies for hypothyroidism, but also they're familiar with the alternative methods. And unlike most doctors, we're actually used to seeing people act, actually get well from things. You know, the residents that train with us in our residency training program, one of the most common comments is it's the first time they've seen anybody get well with, whether it's high blood pressure, or diabetes, or whatever. Because under conventional practice, people just don't get well. It's not even part of the paradigm. They tell you, you'll be on drugs the rest of your life. You're going to be sick forever. That's just how it is. So here, at least we have doctors that are, will do their best to help you recover. But I have to tell you, in my experience, most long-term hypothyroid patients that have been medicated will still require some level of medication in order to maintain normal function, but not all. And some actually are able to normalize. Uh, and it may be that many people were put on medications inappropriately too. Some doctors will put people on medication, not because they're hypothyroid, but because they're fat or they're cold or they're low energy or something, and they use it like a stimulant. And that's not really the way it's designed or, you know, what would be considered medically appropriate. So it may be some of the people were saying get well, maybe never should have been on medication to begin with. Great. Thank you. Jamie says, I was told that you have a supplemental program for Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease. Could you elaborate on the program? I do remember one of the doctors talking about that. Yeah, I'll talk about Parkinson's. Parkinson's was a very frustrating disease because we found that diet and fasting, although helpful, wasn't enough to completely control the tremor and problems with Parkinson's. But the conventional medical treatment of Parkinson's disease has very serious problems. There's a drug called cinnamon that's used that's Cardopa and L-Dopa. And L-Dopa, although it's effective, at controlling the tremor, if you use it in a high enough quantity, causes severe nausea. And so you just can't get enough in uh, to be effective. And so they put another drug in there called Cardopa, which irreversibly binds vitamin B6 and ultimately leads to dementia and other problems and premature death, and it's a big mess. And so there was a doctor um, that pioneered some alternative approaches to this. His name happened to be Marty Hines. And although he was uh, he developed a way of using a natural source of L-DOPA from Mucuna. And instead of using the Cardopa drug, he would use various amino acids and nutritional supplements to control the nausea. And, and it worked. And so this is a strategy uh, that's different than our normal strategy of just diet, sleep, and exercise, you know, maybe fasting. We have to use some exogenous nutrient supplementation. It's a nutritional medicine approach. But we have two of our doctors that did that training, Dr. Sultana and Dr. Varas. And they do work with patients that have Parkinson's disease that diet and exercise and fasting alone were not enough to control. And they're able to get management of that condition using L-DOPA in the form of Mucona, but without the negative effects of the drugs that are normally associated with it. So we're quite satisfied that this is a good compromise strategy. And for the patients that are interested in that, they can work with one of either Dr. Varas or Dr. Sultana. And they're both on our phone coaching service, so they could contact them about the details. I'm not an expert in the use of this. You know me, AJ, I don't like anything where you have to use anything from the outside, but they're much more open-minded. And so they're willing to you know, work with people where they're at and take advantage of some of these you know, medical treatment protocols that are necessary for people that have these you know, very difficult conditions. Well, I can vouch for how great both of those doctors are. And I've seen Dr. Sultana for years and he's yes. terrific. And I know Dr. Varesh is too. So we'll keep posting the link for the phone coaching. So some of the people are not liking your answer about salt, <laughs> saying that they have genetically low blood pressure and they must eat salt. I don't, my blood pressure is 88 over 55 and I don't eat salt. So well, normal blood pressure it, from our viewpoint is 90 over 60. And that means some people are going to be 80 over 50. Some people are going to be hundred over 70, but because there's a bell curve there. But, you know, uh, most people that think they have low blood pressure and that that's why they're having their symptoms is not 
true. They may have orthostatic hypotension. They may have uh, neuroendocrine problems. They may even, there are some people, for example, that do have a higher salt need than others. People with hypoparathyroidism that don't produce the mineral corticoids necessary to absorb the salt. So there are some people where you, you know, you have to use, uh, modify the diet in order to meet their specific needs. But most people that think they have genetically low hypertension and that's a, the answer is salt, they may actually have a problem that needs to be addressed and the salt may actually be functioning as a band-aid but wouldn't necessarily be correcting the underlying condition. On the other hand, if you are talking about increasing sodium from a, the, the thousand milligrams that might be in the diet uh, to 1500 milligrams, which is still be considered real. I mean, that may be fine in order to mitigate symptoms without necessarily running into the problems. We're talking diets five or 10 grams of sodium chloride, you know, that people are eating now, these very, very high salt diet, diets. Uh, uh, there's a huge difference between that and what we're talking about as a health promoting level. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Like you'll say that no salt, and they'll keep saying, "But what a little bit, a little bit of miso, a little bit of raw coconut aminos." So, what part of no salt don't you understand? A little bit of that. When you actually add it up, it's not that little bit after all. You know, it's actually quite a lot. And a lot of these phony salts, uh, like the the amino acids, uh, uh, the Bragg's, and the this is just sodium in a different format, oftentimes. And so, you know, or they're using uh, monosodium glutamate. They're using different forms of. Of, of, of salts. And so, you know, a lot of it's very misleading. The, the reality is the biggest justification with salt is get off the salt, let yourself neuroadapt. You won't want, need, or crave it as much. And then you'll start to actually enjoy whole natural foods and you can feel how well how that works. They're not going to stop having salt available if you decide you need to spread it over your food, but give yourself a chance to get healthy and then decide whether or not you have to be an addict or not. How, how long has the True North Health Center been in existence? 36 years. And, and now approximately how many patients have come through that, whether they water fast or not? thousand people so far have been through, or it's maybe more now. The last time we did a calculation, it was over 20,000. Have you met anybody other than Dr. Doug Lyle and my husband, Charles, that could use anything sparingly? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Lyle. Yeah, that's about it, right? Uh, Jasjeet says, does Dr. Goldhammer allow light coconut milk in True North food? I'm curious because I see a lot of recipes having coconut milk. I think there, are, you know, there are some recipes that use uh, coconut milk. Coconut milk is very high fat, high saturated fat. So if it is used, I think you would use it like we would use any nuts or seeds or other high fat foods. You use it with portion control and some some consideration. If your goal is weight loss, that may not be the kind of foods that we'd be encouraging. If your goal is weight gain, it may actually have some utility to use some of these more concentrated foods just because it's a way of getting a lot of calories in a small space. For most of us that are trying to lose or maintain weight, we're better off trying to minimize how much of these highly processed foods we use. And let's face it, what are we using coconut milk with? Some kind of highly processed concoction, which might be great if you're making a special treat and you want your non-health oriented teenagers to eat it or something, but wouldn't necessarily be what we would consider a staple food. Right, thank you. Julie says, on the Ritual podcast, I heard you talk about your belief that regular water fasting might have the most helpful outcomes for healthy people. What is your opinion about how long and how often should the fast be in order to optimize health? I'm clear you said that there wasn't data to support the hypothesis at this point, but I'm happy to go with your gut feelings and life experience. Yeah, you know, there isn't data yet because it's a really important question and it's gonna be the topic of next year's major study that we're doing at the True Health Center where we're trying to look not only at long-term adherence issues, but also, you know, what's the best for healthy people to stay healthy. Um, we're confident that our dietary recommendations are on solid ground. We don't know yet how often, how much, and how to tell what the right amount of fasting for a given individual are. We're trying to develop non-invasive diagnostic parameters that'll give us that information. What I believe is though, and what I do personally, and what we do with a lot of the staff at the True North Health Centers, we get people doing the diet, sleep, and exercise every day, all year long. We try to use 16 hours of fasting every day. And then we take a week off to do a fast. And if at the end of five to seven days, you have no symptoms, you're clinically stable, the numbers are good, then we go back to healthy living and eating and move on with it. If at the end of a week, you're having some detoxification symptoms or healing crisis, we continue the fast until it's resolved. And you know that's that could go on and on. What we're finding is people eating this way and living this way don't tend to need the long-term marathon fast in order to get the kind of results that we're looking for. 
they don't have the elevated blood pressure, blood sugar, and weight, and other issues. And so short-term fasting seems to be highly effective. It's my belief that we're going to find out that fasting 16 hours every day, and maybe fasting a week or 10 days or whatever, once a year or once every other year, may turn out to be the best way of helping promote long-term health and healthy people. I have a lot of patients now that are with me 25, 30, 35 years, they've been doing this practice and they seem to be doing very, very well. We're gonna formalize it in a study. I can't say with certainty, but that's what my guess is, is that periodically fasting is gonna benefit healthy people, even though they're already doing all the right things. Now, in fairness, most of my patients, I know you're gonna have this, try to find this difficult to believe AJ, but some of my patients don't maintain a strictly uh, whole plant food SOS free diet all year long without any variation. There is some variation that occurs with some patients. And as a consequence, uh, those individuals uh, definitely are going to benefit for a chance to recalibrate. How often depends on the patient. Wow. Thank you. So I guess I'm not, not, I guess I did listen to the podcast twice. You did talk about your brother and his health journey. And so Kit says, what is your exact food and supplement protocol that you used for your brother and others with cardiovascular disease? Do you limit fruit like some of the other programs or like Dr. Esselstyn asked them to eat green six times a day? So um, I have very little control over my brother. He is my older brother, which is why he had to go, you know, for 25 years of me nagging him before he actually was willing to do anything. Um, so he had gotten to the point he was quite overweight and ultimately, despite my nagging, um, had a cardiac arrest and was successful at reversing it, avoiding bypass and doing it with diet and lifestyle change. The recommendations I made to him is the same recommendation I make to all my patients, an exclusively whole plant food, SOS free diet, regular appropriate exercise and abundant sleep. And that's exactly what he did. And that's exactly what he does. And as a consequence, he's lost the weight, he's recovered his health. He looks fabulous. And uh, it's, although he was, you know, it took a while for him to come around, um, I'm really, really pleased to see how well he continues to do uh, on an exclusively whole plant food diet. Terrific. Why are some people able to achieve and maintain significant weight loss while others can lose the weight but cannot sustainably keep it off? What can I do as a health coach to support and motivate them and encourage them to stay the course? So the first thing I would suggest to you as a health coach is to make sure you go to each week to Dr. Lyle's podcast which um, is freely available. And I'm blanking on the- uh, Beat your genes? Beat, beat your genes. So go to Beat Your Genes and listen to what he uh, has to say, because I think you're gonna find um, he's got a tremendous amount of insight into understanding why it's so difficult for people to escape and then stay out of the dietary pleasure trap. Um, and I, so that would be number one. Number two, I'd say either read The Pleasure Trap, or if you don't like reading, listen to it. Because we had, uh, Chef AJ uh, did a professional recording of this, did a fabulous job. And I know that's how I enjoyed listening to it again, was actually listening to it. And got stuff out of a book that I helped write by listening to it. Because, you know, we process information differently sometimes when we listen to things than when we read them. And I, at least I certainly do. So I've, I really encourage people that, either read it or listen to it, because I think once you understand the pleasure trap, you'll understand what you're actually up against. And then the third thing to realize is that not everybody is going to be amenable to making changes. So it's just like not every person with every disease can recover their health fully. Not everybody is going to be able to make these kind of radical diet and lifestyle changes, or no, do they want to make these radical diet and lifestyle changes? Sometimes we can't understand how it is somebody else would insist on doing things that so clearly to us violate common sense. But, you know, we're, we're all different, you know, and that's, and we have to support people's rights to make the fully informed decisions that they want. The problem is a lot of times people aren't fully informed because they don't even know there's an option or there's an opportunity. So our job is to just give them the option. Their job is to decide whether they want to implement it or not. You know, I agree with you about listening to things on Audible, I read the book four times and really didn't begin to understand it until I actually had to narrate it. And I have a new book coming out. And if people sign up for my website and buy it the days that we ask, they'll get the Audible for free. And I, I do think that when you hear it, sometimes it, it sinks in better, at least for me. Well, I definitely want to get the Audible for <laughs> sure. So I'll be going on uh, and picking that up right away. When will that be out? Uh, we think next Wednesday, which is October 7th. Next Wednesday. Excellent. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, looking to I'm looking forward to listening to it. 
Thank you. For people who are overweight, when should they start to incorporate exercise as they transition to a healthy diet? Well, for people that are overweight, the, the sooner the better, but you need to do it gradually. You don't want to go from zero to 100. And so the best things to do is, you know, try to in, introduce an exercise program within your comfort. It might, you know, at some points, it might just be doing some very gentle walking, you know, frequent short periods of activity throughout the course of the day, and then slowly build up your uh, capacities so that you don't end up injuring yourself and then having a setback because, you know, you've lost the ability to be mobile. So walking, hiking, biking, swimming, these are all activities that involve the whole body that are often very helpful to people. You know, the stretching flexibility uh, and, and those activities are also very helpful. You know, recently we added in, uh, two new doctors to the staff at the True North Health Center. Uh, residents that um, completed our residency training program have stayed on as physicians. Um, uh, and both of those are uh, improving our exercise recommendations. We're putting programs together. They're both available for coaching and, and guidance on our, our website. And um, so I'm starting to realize just how complicated it actually is because you have to come up with the ability to adapt to people's individual limitations. Just like you do with diet, the same thing is true uh, with fitness training. So, you know, if you're having trouble, you, you can get people to give you some specific advice how to compensate for your particular limitations. Great, thank you. For a parent trying to get their kids to eat healthy whole plant foods and eliminate junk food, what can they do if their partner is not on board and brings unhealthy food into the house and the kids whine for it and refuse to eat healthy options? You never had that problem with your son, did you? No, I was very fortunate with my son. That wasn't an issue. So is the question about what if your husband? Well, I, I, they're saying spouse, so conceivably could be either sex. But if you're... Well, you know, one thing I would say is, you know, prevention is the best thing. So the way you prevent that from happening to begin with is make sure when you're selecting your spouse that you select somebody that's willing to respect you enough to support you in health promoting habits. You know, again, they don't necessarily have to be some mirror image. They don't have to do everything you do necessarily, but they need to at least be supportive of you and your limitations, your needs, your goals. So that would be an important consideration, I think, in mate selection is that you find a person compatible and that's willing to help you be healthy and happy. Once you have a person, then I think uh, direct and honest communication can be very helpful. If you can explain to the person that you're not trying to necessarily impose your belief system on them, but you would benefit from their assistance in dealing with your own limitations, that can be helpful. You can use somebody like Dr. Lyle, who does a good job in terms of helping people manipulate other people's behavior so that they'll behave more appropriately. Um, and then, of course, you can always select another spouse if you have to. Uh, that's a kind of worst case scenario, just like you can get a different job, too. You know, if there's a limiting factor in your life that keeps you from being healthy and happy, then I'd say that it's important to try to either modify that, improve that, or change it. Great. Thank you. Monica says, during a True North screening call, Dr. Goldhammer recommended that I read Anatomy of an Epidemic. I finished the book, and I'm curious to know if there are any benefits from fasting for somebody moving forward without anxiety medications. My stay there starts October 27th. The people on psych meds cannot fast. Is that not true anymore? Well, the fact is that many people that are on anxiety medication and antidepressant medications will be well served at coming up with a pattern that will allow them to safely withdraw those medications. And fasting may be a part of that protocol. Once they're stable off their medications, fasting may help them improve their health to the point where the need for medications can be reduced or eliminated. If you read anatomy of an epidemic, you realize that these medications that are used they activate the D2 receptors in the brain and can make it very difficult to withdraw them. We spend a lot of time helping people that are choosing to get free of these medications, withdraw those medications, and then improve their health and habits to the point where they are no longer having anxiety and depression to the point uh, so that the need for medication has been eliminated. I didn't even have to water fast to get off my psych meds. I just had to see Dr. Lyle. And cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the flavor of psychotherapy that Dr. Lyle offers, also appears to be an effective approach to helping people um, deal with anxiety and depression and the reasons that contributes to that. Great. Melissa says, Dr. Goldhammer talked about how long it takes for taste receptors to reset, salt one month, fat three months. But what about sugar? I've been eating whole food plant-based for over a year and doing really well with everything except for sweet cravings. While I can make sweet things healthier, I sh should I still be craving them daily? 
I'm not sure that the sugar cravings ever fully resolve in people because, you know, sugar is such a powerful stimulant in a, in a way that we're designed to uh, be attracted to things like fresh fruit. We were never designed to be in an environment where sugar was highly refined, concentrated, and artificially available. And so I think it's, it's going to be very difficult. Now, it is true, people get to the point where something's like too sweet. So there is some change that occurs, but I don't think that you're ever necessarily completely free of vulnerability to uh, the effects of highly refined carbohydrates, which is why I recommend not eating them. That I think it's, at least for me, it's a lot easier just not to have them than it is to have them and then try to have to go back through that withdrawal kind of effect. Uh, and so, you know, that's been my strategy. If you can eat small amounts, not think about them every day, not find yourself gaining weight, not screwing up your microbiome, not compromising your immune system, not making you vulnerable to all the consequences that everybody else that's gouging this stuff into their face, fine, then maybe you're one of the, the people who can do that. I haven't met that many of those people. You know, most of the people I meet, a little becomes a lot, a lot becomes a problem. It's a constant battle. And they're, they find their life is a lot easier just letting it go. Uh, but then, you know, Dr. Lau will, will argue that, you know, the ego trap also is to, to interplay here. And that sometimes when you try to say all or nothing, people rebel against that. And, you know, that creates its own challenges. So I don't I, I disagree that the ego trap and the, and the pleasure trap are both powerful forces. And perhaps it's because of the two of them that uh, the number of people that are able to successfully navigate that is more limited than what we'd like it to be. Great. Terrific. Melissa says, I read an article on Healthline that fasting may have more adverse effects on women. And she does a link if you need to see it. I think in particular on blood sugar control. What does Dr. Goldhammer think? And is it more likely to lower a woman's metabolism if the fast is longer than a few days? So this idea that fasting permanently lowers metabolism is kind of an old wives tale. And we've actually done uh, some research. We've even had calorimetry machines here and what we found is that the metabolic rate, although it is slow during fasting, while you're fasting, by the time people have refed for the length of the fast, their metabolic function has returned to its normal level. There is no evidence that persistent metabolic slowdown occurs. Uh, and as a consequence, the, what, what really happens is when you go on a fast, you lose fat, you lose fiber because there's no fiber in your gut, you lose water because you dehydrate a little bit, you, you lose glycogen, a couple pounds of glycogen from your muscles. When you regain weight, you regain glycogen, you regain water, you regain fiber, you regain uh, uh, muscle, but you don't regain fat if you're on a whole plant food SOS free diet. And this study that we're doing right now at the center, we have half a dozen patients that are currently enrolled. We've got 30 people that we're going to be taking through this. It looks exactly at what the body composition changes are, and including visceral fat and adipose uh, uh, and subcutaneous fat. And so far, what we found is that visceral fat is preferentially mobilized during fasting, that uh, the weight that's regained during fasting, fat continues to go down, even as the scale goes up, because all you're doing is pumping back your glycogen, your water, your fiber, and you will continue to lose fat down to your optimum weight. And now it is true, if you're a female, you're going to have to work twice as hard for half the results, because women have estrogen, which is a fat storage hormone, unlike men with their testosterone. Uh, which respond much more readily. So, yeah, it is true. And there's differences between individuals in terms of their efficiency. Some people super efficient, other people not so much. But, uh, you know, most of our ancestors were the efficient ones. The ones that could get on the boat ride and they, you know, and, 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 and didn't uh, hold on to the reserves well, well, they got eaten by everybody else, didn't they? So your ancestors was the one that were doing the eating, not the eating by virtue of that you're here, so. Right. People are asking, what do you do for chocolate cravings? Um, I don't, uh, personally don't have ch chocolate cravings. Don't know, know what that is. That's not been part of my uh, experience. I was very fortunate to get started very early in life. So never had felt that. So I would say that uh, if you have chocolate cravings, it's probably very similar to what people describe when they have cocaine cravings or alcohol cravings or other addictive cravings. And I would say that if you can't uh, break free of that addiction on your own, that I would come to the True North Health Center, undergo fasting, and that eventually your body will adapt and, and it'll get free of that addiction. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure that there's any easy way around it. I mean, people really like chocolate and, you know, chocolate's very uh, impacting. It has 2,500 calories per pound. You know, it's one of the most concentrated foods out there. It has a highly addictive nervous system in the form of caffeine in it. So it's really one of the 
you know, if you're really trying to get people addicted to a food, it's probably one of one of the best foods to try to do that with. And maybe that's why there's a whole row of chocolate in a whole foods market. You know, when you walk around, I mean, it's really popular and people use a lot of it. And, you know, it's very concentrated. And I think it's uh, one of the most important foods if your goal is to maintain the strategic fat reserves of the country. You know, chocolate's really helping us maintain our number one position in the world in terms of having the most uh, uh, extremely obese patients. Yeah, it's so popular now that you can buy it at Petco. Wonderful. Even though dogs are not supposed to have chocolate. So Neil says, what do you think about stevia or other natural sweeteners? Well, I, I think that all sweeteners are in the same boat. Now, you know, some, one uh, type of sweetener may be less absorbed uh, than another. And so it gives you diarrhea, but not as much obesity. But, you know, the bottom line is all of these sweeteners are designed to artificially stimulate dopamine in the brain, fool the brain's tidy mechanism, leads to overeating. I don't think any of them should be used. And I don't think there's any need for them because when you're eating a whole natural food diet, the foods themselves, particularly in a healthy palate, are quite interesting and desirable. And you can get, now we have recipe books, the Bravo cookbook, the Bravo Express cookbook, uh, Straight Up Cooking, AJ's book, um, and the Health Promoting Cookbook. We have five completely SOS-free cookbooks that have hundreds of recipes that are simple enough, even I can make most of them. So I don't think there's any reason why we have to resort, and don't none of those uh, cookbooks re uh, d rely on artificial sweeteners in order to make the foods palatable and enjoyable and simple to make. Yeah. If you have to put stevia on it, you don't like what you're eating. That's what I say, because that stuff's just nasty. And, and as you know, I've interviewed you for the GI Health Summit, which airs November 14th, along with like 40 other GI doctors. And they all say that that's actually worse for your gut, the artificial sweeteners, even stevia. They say it's very bad for the microbiome. So, that, so Dr. Goldhammer, in the past 30 years, have you seen your patient population change? Have they gotten larger? Have they gotten sicker? Or is it pretty much the same type of patient that you're seeing? Well, it's, it's, it's difficult to be certain because remember, when we started off, we had a small facility. This was 1984. And so we were running you know, 12 or 15 patients. And we were very low key. So like, I mean, I would speak to 100 people at a lecture. That was a big presentation. And you know, now we're talking sometimes to you know, half a million people. And so, I mean, think how many lectures would we have to give at 100 apiece to get to 500,000 exposures? So you know, now we're speaking to a much broader audience. Uh, we have, you know, we're admitting more than 1,000 people a year through the Trinity Health Center for Fasting. Um, and we have uh, much sicker patients and also much healthier patients. It's really interesting. We get both uh, ends of the spectrum. I'm seeing people now there are 30 and 35 year follow-up patients that are continuing to do this program. They've been doing it for decades and they're absolutely uh, inspiring because you see people in their sixth, seventh, eighth, even ninth decades um, that, are, that are thriving and continuing to do well. Um, and I'm also seeing some of the sickest patients now that we wouldn't necessarily have been able to manage before, but now we have a much broader medical support staff so we can handle people with a lot more complex medical management conditions. And, and so, uh, I'm not sure if looking at my population exactly what conclusions I can draw because we get a lot of these people that are absolutely fit and we see people that are really in, in desperate straits and just a whole lot more of them. Okay, Dr. Goldhammer, we're almost at 90 minutes. I think maybe we should have you come back, don't you? I'll just finish up with the, the uh, there's a question that I wanted to end on because I think it's a, a fun one or a couple that I wanted to end on. But I do want to say there's been a lot of questions on GI health in general. So I'm going to, and you're an expert on that summit. So maybe when you come back, there's everything from reflux to IBS to bloating and, if, and constipation. So maybe we could, we could do a, a, another sure. Q&A because there's so many on GI health, but I would like people to watch the GI health summit. And I just want to ask you, because I hear hearing from some of the people that follow your way of eating is that everybody's telling them they're too thin. What do we say to those people? Well, if they are too thin, usually there's uh, side effects. They have fatigue, there's blood values, in which case it's pretty straightforward. We would give them increased caloric density so that they would be able to regain the necessary weight. Uh, but that's actually very rare. It's just that because everybody's so fat and sick now, anybody that's normal weight is considered abnormal. And, and you are. Two thirds of people are overweight or obese. So anybody that's normal weight is in a, in a small minority. And a lot of those people that are telling you you're too thin are just not comfortable with the fact that by comparison, you make them look 
you know, huge. And so it's easier to attack you for being too thin than to admit that maybe they may have to cut back on their chocolate cheesecake. So uh, on the other hand, it is possible to be underweight. You can have a BMI below 16, or you can have, you know, people that are depleted. In those cases, we would help them figure out why they're not absorbing their food, or maybe they need to eat a more concentrated uh, diet. And, and certainly, you know, if, if you think you're underweight, uh, call and talk to one of our coaches and uh, doctors online, and they'll talk to you. They'll look at your numbers. They can look at your lab. And if you need to gain weight, listen, I, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward on how to increase caloric density in the diet. And you can do it healthfully. Uh, but mostly it's, it's people are just um, not comfortable with the fact that, you know, you, you may have somewhat disproportion to, the, to them. And, you know, what can I say? Thank you. People are commenting on how nice your skin is. And here's the last question, because I thought it was sort of fun from Patricia. She says, Dr. Goldhammer, what is it that you won't most want people to know, but are either never or infrequently asked? Yeah, well, what I want people to know is that health results from healthful living. And there's no shortcut. It's diet, sleep, and exercise. And that we believe that fasting may help people that are you know, needing to make improvements in their diet, sleep, and exercise habits. Uh, and possibly maybe uh, a component in health promotion. And that a healthful diet from my viewpoint is a whole plant food diet that's free of salt, oil, and sugar. And I know there are people that disagree with that, with us on that, but I think as more and more research comes out, we're more likely to find that this model that we've been advocating for the past 36 years is in fact true. And then we'll be able to say that we were right and they were wrong. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldhammer. I thoroughly enjoyed this and I'm sure everyone else did as well. My pleasure.